Well, uh, you know, there's various theories about an afterlife, Coach. Uh, uh, you know, millions believe in uh, reincarnation. You mean like when you come back as a chicken? <laughs> well, not necessarily as a chicken, Coach. Uh, all right, the Hindus believe that uh, what you come back as depends on your behavior in this life. You know, if you led a good life, you come back in an uh, elevated state. Like Colorado. <laughs> the Carthaginians defending the city were attacked by three Roman legions. Carthaginians were proud and brave, but they couldn't hold. They were massacred. Arab women stripped them of their tunics and their swords and lances 2,000 years ago. I was here. <laughs> you don't believe me, do you, Brad? Do you believe in reincarnation? I do now. Mrs. Templeton, do you believe that your daughter, Ivy, is the reincarnation of Mr. Hoover's daughter, Audrey Rose? Yes. Reincarnation is something you just can't avoid. You go to the supermarket, and there it is at the checkout stand. Turn on your car radio and you hear a song about it. I'm so darn glad it let me try it again. Cause my last time on earth I lived a whole world of sin. I'm so glad that I know my land I knew then. Gonna keep on trying until I reach my highest ground. The bookstores have any number of books and magazines describing and explaining it. I am working with the assumption that most of you have an interest in reincarnation, which is why you're sitting here tonight. Your local college probably holds extension courses on reincarnation. Actually, reincarnation is as old as, as, as life, uh, as old as philosophy. I definitely believe that, that, that I've been here before and that I'll probably leave this, this body and come back at some other point in another body and have another life. I was in so many places that I felt I had been there before. And I can't tell you the number of cities. Very exotic, out of the range of tourist cities. I knew I had never been there before mm -hmm. in this lifetime. But when I was there, I'm telling you, I knew temples, I knew streets, I knew food, things that had happened to me. Just what is reincarnation and how many people really believe in it? In the next half hour, we're going to examine reincarnation from the point of view of history, religion, and science. Reincarnation is a belief that's held by a surprising number of Americans from all walks of life and all religious persuasions. George Gallup, Jr., respected pollster and head of Princeton University's Religion Research Institute, conducted the first in-depth survey into belief in reincarnation in 1981. He published his findings in his remarkable new book, Adventures in Immortality. When we look at the, the figure for the nation as a whole, we find that 23% uh, believe in reincarnation, that is, the rebirth of the soul in a new body after death. Uh, I think one of the most interesting findings is that there is very little difference uh, in those who believe in life after death on the basis of age groupings. For example, 68% of persons 18 to 29 years of age say they believe in life after death, and that is statistically the same as the figure recorded for those 50 and older. That figure is 67%. 15% uh, of the populace said they'd had a, uh, a near-death or on the verge of death kind of experience, uh, of whom uh, perhaps a third have had the uh, what might be described as the traditional out-of-body experience. I knew I had a heart attack, and all of a sudden I was looking down at my body from about 10 feet above the stretcher. I didn't feel any pain, I just felt I was there, but I definitely was not in my body. I was just observing the situation. I don't know really what the experience was. I can't explain it, but here I was experiencing 
experiencing this pain and then all of a sudden I hear I was sitting up and looking around and I did feel separated from the torture that was going on in my body and and yet I was still me. I watched from the moment I was born till the, till the moment I died. I remembered every physical sensation I'd ever had as if I was doing it now. So the evidence suggests that the soul separates from the body, just as religion is taught from time immemorial. But the idea of reincarnation is presently rejected by mainline Christian and Jewish orthodoxy. However, there are scholars and religionists who believe that reincarnation can be reconciled with the major faiths. The academic community has long been interested in reincarnation and its role in Christianity. Uh, in my view, reincarnation is compatible with Christian belief. Um, it uh, has become, of course, generally taken to be heterodox, but I believe it is compatible with uh, uh, any kind of Christian orthodoxy, such as is expounded in the Nicene Creed, for example. Now, re-embodiment, reincarnation, sits very well with the idea of purgatory or uh, uh, some sort of... Uh, uh, intermediate state, because there, there is something going on which is a process. Um, then when you come to the New Testament, the return of uh, Elijah was expected, uh, and this implies some kind of re-embodiment. Uh, re uh, resurrection itself, of course, is a re-embodiment, and that, of course, is a central, if not the central, uh, doctrine in Christian orthodoxy. Those who study Kabbalah, those who study Jewish mysticism, and Hasidus and Hasidism uh, is based, much of its philosophy is based on Jewish mysticism. Part of its value system and part of its philosophy is the realization that a soul is not here once, uh, uses up his energy in the course of his lifetime, and then is either discarded or goes back to the source of souls. But a soul is an entity which has a mission to fulfill, and uh, that mission may take more than one trip down to this earth to fulfill all that is incumbent upon that soul. Of course, not everyone agrees. But in one of the world's major religions, there is no controversy whatsoever about reincarnation. In India, over 650 million people, 90% of the population, accept reincarnation as a fact. Surprisingly, many sociologists and scholars of religion believe that the influx of Indian spiritual traditions contributes heavily to reincarnation's popularity in the West. This Bhagavad Gita is the essence of the 5,000-year-old Vedic scriptures. It describes that the soul is eternal. It simply changes bodies at death. So at the time of death, we believe that one's actions in this life, or karma, and his desires determine one's consciousness at the time of passing. If one has material desires, he will be carried by the subtle body to another material body to fulfill his desires. But if his consciousness is spiritual, then he will attain a spiritual body which is eternal, full of knowledge, and happiness and live in association with God, Krishna. When we look back through Western history, we find that some of the greatest minds accepted reincarnation. Among the ancient Greeks, Pythagoras, the mathematician, and the philosopher Socrates. Many of the early Christians, like Origen, the father of the church in Alexandria in the 4th century, and St. Jerome preached reincarnation as a tenet of faith. However, a gathering of bishops at the Council of Constantinople in the 6th century officially banned all doctrines of reincarnation from the church. Churches, institutions generally, do not like the idea of a reincarnational or a karmic scenario because it enables one to do without the institution. They like uh, the individual to be entirely de dependent 
uh, upon them for uh, salvation every inch of the way. Yet reincarnation resurfaced during the Renaissance. Giordano Bruno, Italy's leading philosopher and contemporary of Michelangelo, openly taught reincarnation and was finally taken before the Inquisition and burned at the stake. During the Enlightenment in Europe, French philosopher Voltaire said, it is not more surprising to be born twice than once. English poets Blake and Wordsworth wrote about reincarnation. The list extends on to our own American pantheon of greats, among them Thomas Paine, John Adams, Walt Whitman, Thomas Edison, and Henry Ford. Benjamin Franklin composed his own epitaph. The body of B. Franklin, printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out and stripped of its lettering and gilding, lies here, food for worms. But the work shall not be lost, for it will, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more elegant edition, corrected and improved by the author. Professor R. Elwood of the University of Southern California School of Religious Studies explains how reincarnation was popularized in America during the last 100 years. American interest in Indian philosophy and religion goes back at least to early in the 19th century with transcendentalist thinkers like Emerson and Thoreau who were very profoundly moved and affected by the concepts which they derived from reading the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita in early translations. I think that in the late 19th century, probably theosophy, more than any other vehicle, was responsible for wide dissemination of the idea of reincarnation in America. In the 20th century, there have been many, many Eastern groups come to America, groups like Western Zen and the Vedanta societies were established in the aftermath of the world's parliament of religions. Later in the 20th century, others joined them, such as the Self-Realization Fellowship and, of course, Krishna Consciousness beginning in the 1960s. Next life, I wonder what I'm going to be. Next life, what's going to happen to me? Next life, you know you just can't tell. Will I be in heaven or hell? purpose is to get back to where you came from, is to, to keep purifying yourself so that you can go back to wherever you came from. And you have to take the steps in order to get back there. How else can you account for little children, I mean such little children that are prodigies, that, that have such fabulous talent, I mean it, they've thought it'd be a reincarnation of someone, you know, an artist in previous life. If the soul is eternal and the body is temporary, that means the soul has to go someplace else uh, after, it's, after this body dies. So even according to the laws of physics, that energy is either matter or, you know, manifest like this or is in some process of transmutation. Um, what's being transmuted is the soul. So it seems to make sense that, you know, what I'm experiencing now is the effect of a previous life in a previous body. Yeah. But what about our high schools? Should they teach about reincarnation? Here's what some of our high school students think. I think that it's a subject that should be uh, more carefully looked at. It should be taught in the schools. It's it's something that we all should think about, you know? I think they don't teach um, reincarnation in public schools because they consider it a part of religion rather than science. People can also control people's minds by withdrawing a subject from being seen in censorship. It's done all the time. They may not hear about it in school, but more than likely they'll see it on TV when they get home. You are totally outside your body. The white light is now moving you back in time to a past light that explains your husband's rage and yet the power that you have over him. Describe what you look like. What are you wearing? Armor. Armor. 
How does it feel to wear this armor? It's heavy. Heavy. Tell me about that javelin. What are you doing with it? I'm trying to pierce it through the hearts of my enemies. Look into their eyes. Look into the eyes of the people that you're piercing with your javelin. Does any one of them feel familiar to you in this lifetime? My husband. Your husband. What's going on? He fell off his horse. I knocked him off. Got off my horse. And then I took the cow and stabbed him. So cry. <laughs> now stand there at the moment that you killed him, only this time say compassion and love over and over. Movie producer and director Frank DiFolito, the author of Audrey Rose, tells how he became interested in reincarnation. My own son, uh, who was uh, born in 1962, uh, and uh, the normal, uh, very intelligent child in every way, and showed no particularly remarkable interests he was just a normal child. And uh, then uh, one day after we had moved to California and he was only six years of age, my wife and I were outside on the lawn and we, we heard this rather magnificent ragtime piano playing. And we thought it was the radio going on. And we said, what is that? Well, did you turn the radio on? And lo and behold, we, it sounded like it was our piano. And we went in and we saw this little boy playing stride piano. It was the most amazing, I think, thing that's ever happened to me, the most amazing example of uh, not hereditary brilliance, but, but of the evocation of a past lifetime's intelligence and development, musical development. But what about proof? Serious research is being done by scientists such as Dr. Peter Ramster of the University of Sydney in Australia. When I first started the research, I didn't really have much belief in reincarnation at all. Um, I thought it was something that was going to be uh, interesting, but not that it was going to actually bring any proof or bring any, any real results. Um, the results uh, that I did achieve were very surprising to me. Uh, I never thought that uh, people would be able to give names and dates and and places that were able to be found, which we also were able to show that they couldn't have possibly known. I just can't wait to get there to see um, if everything is exactly as I see it in my mind. This is the part I'm, I'm looking forward to. Well, I've got mixed feelings. I'm, I'm not worried about it at all, but I feel a little bit excited and it'll be absolutely wonderful and fantastic if we do dig up any information that can prove to me, to me as much as to anybody else, that uh, I really was there once. The following excerpts from the carefully documented film, The Reincarnation Experiments, are striking examples of unprejudiced scientific studies. Our first case history is Gwen McDonald, a housewife living in Australia who had never left her native New South Wales. Under regression, she claimed to be Mary Duncan, a woman living in the county of Somerset about 200 years ago. What are the other villages around your area so we can find the village? Oh, the, um... Oh, the... The, uh... The blood. The... Uh, Chapel. Interesting names, but not there. Not on the most modern and large-scale maps. So to the older ones, back to the 18th century, 
and suddenly the names began to leap out. Alfred was there. Stone became Stone Chapel. And there was Hornblotten, very close to the way she pronounced it. What was your name? Mary Duncan, but they call me Rose. And then she named the people of the area. The names were found in the old records. What was your mother's maiden name? What family did she come from? Lethbridge, Bessie said. Have the temper of a Lethbridge. The temper of my grandfather. When they took her to Somerset in England, they took as their independent witness Dr. Basil Cottle, reader in medieval English studies at Bristol University. Under trance, Gwen described a path to the cottage in which she had lived. The path crossed a fork in a stream where there was a unique stepped waterfall. Everything was just as she said it would be. The fork, the tiered waterfall, and she was off. Moving with the purpose of someone who knows where she is and where to go. She led them unerringly on a beeline to the cottage. <laughs> After finding the cottage in which she said she had lived, from the outside, she described a window that was no longer there, and the wall was covered with ivy. From the inside, it was clear and unmistakable that a window had been there and was now filled in. This was only the beginning of many things she described in trance that proved to be correct. Cynthia Henderson, a housewife who had never been out of Australia, revealed a past life as an 18th century Frenchwoman, Emily de Cheville. Under hypnosis, she could suddenly understand and speak the colloquial French of the Normandy area. Excuse me, could you give me care, Saint Michel? Petit maison. Once in France, she was able to give precise directions to the cathedral in which she had been married. The big road goes between Rouen and Saint Michel. Under trance, she had described in detail the exterior and interior of the cathedral. To the surprise of the independent observer, Mr. Antoine Le Breton, her descriptions were extraordinarily accurate. C'est une recherche qui est passionnante, qui est amusante, mais qui est, qui est également passionnante. C'est-à-dire que c'est un peu à, à la limite du crédit, mais de la croyance, un peu ce qui est un, tout à fait différent. Ce sont deux niveaux. Euh, the story of our third subject also began with a deep hypnotic trance. What's your full name? James Archibald Burns. I don't like Archibald. Why don't you like Archibald? Because it's my father's name. And I guess I never really liked the man. I 
don't think I ever saw him laugh. He was... He, he did laugh sometimes, but not in front of me. Only when he was with his drinking mates. Now you'll move to the time when you were in practice. I want you to describe to me where this, where your practice is. It's in Blagari. Dr. James Burns, according to Helen Pickering, had been a successful medical practitioner living in Scotland in the 1800s. He had been a man of substance and education, and her account of his life led us to the northern Scottish town of Aberdeen. This is the city in which Helen claimed she had been a student of medicine as the young James Burns. With us in Aberdeen were two impartial witnesses, Anne Gordon from the History Department of the University of Aberdeen, and Joanne Buckkin, a young reporter from the city's FM radio station, North Sound Radio. At first we had blindfolded Helen so that she had no clue as to where she was. And then we took her to a part of Dockland from which, if she had lived there before as James Burns, she should be able to find her way when the blindfold was removed. She should be able to lead us to the place she had spoken of and even drawn for us the old College of Medicine, Marshall College. Some parts of Aberdeen still retain the flavor of the past, of the time of James Burns. But even those places have seen some change, yet there was enough for Helen to feel familiarity. I'm going to go around there. Where? Uh, wait a minute. Um, no, it's around here. Yeah, yeah, around here. Right. You can see the bay from the back of the dorms, there's always a mist on the bay. And in the early morning, when the sun's coming up, the mist is pink. And you can see the masts of the sailing boats in the harbor. Three masters and two masters. Might be getting close to the seaman's mission. Let's have a look at this building. So familiar. They're all along here, all the way down. And the mission, seaman's mission, yeah. as far as I can yeah. remember, was up here on a corner. We checked, of course, and to our witnesses' great surprise, Helen Pickering was right. An Australian woman, new to Scotland, had told them a thing they didn't know about their own city. The old seaman's mission had once stood exactly where she had said. Oh, no. No, no. Well, I'm trying to remember the, the, uh, what I could see from the top of the college. I've done these drawings last night. Right. Helen's talented drawing of the old College of Medicine was done weeks before in Sydney. College of Medicine in Aberdeen. That's the back or the front of it? That's the main entrance here, and it's a big courtyard. And what, what's behind there? You know, the well, if you look out the top windows, in an easterly direction, you can see the port of Aberdeen. Right. And that was where the library and lecture theatre were. We found in Aberdeen an old and elaborate drawing, Marshall College of Medicine, as it had once been. But even this drawing had been done after James Burns' time, and there had been many alterations inside and out. The atmosphere inside took hold of Helen at once, as though the changes outside had left her unprepared for the sudden surge of familiarity. Oh, wow. A strange feeling. I'd like to go up those stairs. Can we go up? Can you remember me saying that you could look down on the entrance from the stairs? I think I do. Oh, 
Okay, I feel like I've seen a ghost. Mm. There's the library. I said there was a library. I've got to sit down. This is not a library, it's a museum now. It houses many memories of the past, but then so does Helen Pickering. You see, in the old days of James Burns, this was indeed the college library. Now, what's on the other side of the building? Well, the building is not, doesn't have a straight wall at the back. There, it goes out, I think, in a T. Oh, wow, look. Well, that's the T as you described it. Yep, that wasn't there. That top floor, they've added that. Right. And it finished there, because that's all new. All of that's new. Because from that, that yes, that's, yeah. that's all new. That's all new. Because from up at that top windows, you could look right across. So actually, when she drew the drawing of two floors at the back going out to there, stopping there, she actually drew the correct thing. Yeah, that's right. Right. Well, I have been very moved indeed by um, Helen's feeling about the place, especially when she went into this section you know, of the building and sort of realized where the staircases were, where the corridors were, which I didn't know about. You know there's more about it than I do, and I spent five years at this university. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I spent five years running out in this building, mm. and I had no idea there were all those those um, works underneath. They all sell a bit. Right. David Gordon is the only man in the world who knows what the old College of Medicine was like. He's a very practical man who works in the field of oil sciences, but his passion is local history. He wrote a postgraduate paper on the history of the college and meticulously collected every existing plan and drawing from the building's conception to its last restoration. He is the expert. What can you remember, I think you remember, about this building in the 1830s, Helen? Yes, 1830s. 1830, any particular date? That you can remember just 1830s. Early 1830s. Early 1830s. Right. Uh, it was a quadrangle, and the main entrance was at the centre of the quadrangle, but at the right, the right hand wing of the quadrangle, as you face the main entrance, was a chapel, yes. and that ran down on the right hand side. The building itself was three stories tall, and across the top floor were the dormitories. What I'm yes. saying now is not there yes. now, yes. but it's how it was. Yes. There's also a second staircase that is, as you face the main entrance, there is another staircase that is in the building that goes up. It winds back and up, back mm -hmm. and up to the top floor, and that's a stone staircase. And that's that is not there now because we went right through the building, and it's all new. They've obviously yes. taken down the whole of the interior Yes. Because there's just nothing there that resembles it at all. I know, it's been, uh, that's part of the alterations that were made. If you look on this one here, yes. that's the staircase you're looking at, takes you to the, the east wing and right. the other side, the west wing. Right. Now if you look on this plan here, that is the opening here, right. which goes to the cloisters. Right. And then this, this is the staircase you're talking about. So that's the staircase now. there, and that's, that's no right. longer there. That's no longer there. Right, well, that's no. why we couldn't find that's it. Right. Well, let's see if we can follow here. Without ever having seen any marked floor plans, without ever having seen the original drawings, it was abundantly clear that Helen knew things about a building long ago altered from its shape in the 1830s, that she knew where an old staircase had once curved where ancient walls had once stood. She knew. From this upper landing here, in, in the main centre here of the building, yes. was it possible to look down into that main assembly hall? Yes, I, I, it is, or it was, definitely. Right, and that is a lecture theatre to the left? That is lecture theatre, indeed. Right, yes. fine, great. That's right. I wonder if you could uh, tell me if you were uh, at a tutorial and a discussion in the uh, museum or the library and you wanted to wash your hands, yes. where would you go? Is there a ladies room? 
Uh, um, men's room, please. Uh, men's room, <laughs> brother. Yes, that's right. From the second floor level here, yes. uh, you'd go along a small corridor and it was on the right, this, this side. How uh, would it possibly? Let's have a look at this. Here we are. From the main entrance, right, the museum. And on the right, up some steps to the right, and off the center room. There yes. it is. There. There's a closet there. Right. Yes, there is. Are you satisfied that she knows more about this building than a person uh, is likely to know who's never seen the building? It would seem more than coincidental, quite frankly. It may be inexplicable to, in my terms, you know, but uh, certainly uh, from what she's uh, discussed with me before she saw these plans, or even knew these plans existed. Your paper on this, David, was never published. There's no way anybody could walk into a library and pick up a copy. No, the only place that there'll be a copy of my work is in the Open University Archives. And uh, I don't think that Helen has been anywhere near the Open University Archives. She needs long arms. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Especially never having been out of Australia. So, a third experiment and a woman from today's Australia in Scotland for the first time, confronting the one man alive who could confirm the evidence, the things she claimed to have seen in an earlier life. Like all these subjects, it was only under hypnosis that she and they became aware of those traces and reminders of what had gone before. While this new research is certainly thought-provoking, is there any practical benefit to be gained by this method of hypnotic regression? From 1900 until he died in 1945, Edgar Cayce, America's most famous mystic healer, successfully used regression as a method of diagnosis in over 6,000 cases that he treated. Just recently, Dr. Edith Fiore of the University of Miami also had remarkable success. For example, one woman who had had migraines for 40 years during one four-hour session uncovered six lifetimes in which she'd had injuries to her head and one important one in which she had crushed the skull of her baby sister when, the, when she, as a he in that lifetime, was seven years old. In this current life, her headache started when she was seven and she was 47 when I saw her. And following that, two and a half hours under hypnosis during the four-hour session, she has never ever had a a uh, migraine since, and she was having them periodically, and they were devastating. Associations of past life therapists have appeared in many states across America. And I feel like I've been here before. About two years ago, we decided that we wanted to uh, work towards state recognition for this kind of therapy, and we have been accepted as a, uh, an organization for uh, education with an exempt status. We now have inaugurated a training program two years ago, whereby people who are therapists already, psychotherapists, uh, can have training in past life techniques. We may solve some problems stemming from our past lives. But what of the future? What will we be in our next life? Will we be rich or poor? Man or woman? Black or white? Bird or beast? I would come back as myself again. If I had to come back, I'd like to come back as a big cat, a tiger or a lion. So, reincarnation, fact or fiction? Although it may be difficult to see that we change bodies at death, here at the first American Theistic Exhibition, we can easily see that we change bodies during our present life.
the soul cannot be measured with any scientific instrument. Yet this minute non-material entity, the soul, is so powerful that it unceasingly activates each body throughout its entire lifetime. This tiny little spark of life thus moves from one body to another. This is called reincarnation. Is it our destiny to be forever caught in a cycle of birth and death, of old age and disease? Or is there a way out, an eternal existence, a personal spiritual body that doesn't change? That is perhaps the most important question raised by the idea of reincarnation. And if you are pondering this question, you're not in such bad company. You can run, you can hide, but you'll always turn up on the other side. It's a reincarnation, and all of us are part of it. You will fly right through the sky, but you'll have to wait until the day you die. And then you'll forget what happened, and you'll be born again. Born again when it feels right, you'll be born again when you're told that it is time. You've drawn the wheel of time. <laughs>